Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Real Talk. I'm your host, Lieutenant General Brad Webb, Commander of Air Education and Training Command. Uh, and today, our special guest is Brigadier General Brenda Cartier, our incoming, or really imminently incoming, uh, A3, or Director of Operations uh, here at AETC. Uh, as you would expect, there's always been a lot of time uh, that is, uh, or a lot of uh, circumstances that have occurred in the time since we've had our last edition of Real Talk. Um, and so, I really, I really want to circle back to uh, why we do the Real Talks and why we have, and what is our center of gravity. And of course, the center of gravity for all of the, uh, the conversations that we have with respect to uh, our DNI portfolio is it's about the mission. It's about mission, ready, mission effectiveness and, and readiness. And also, it's about dignity and respect. Let's remember the charge that the chief gave us a year ago, which is we need to own this DNI situation. We need to engage in small groups, create uh, safe space, and listen or seek to understand. So there have been several key uh, events that have happened here in the last several months, uh, the first of which is a second racial disparity review. Uh, you'll recall that in the first review, uh, it was very much focused on an African-American portfolio, and specifically uh, with respect to young African-American male population. Uh, since then, we have now uh, done a review that includes AAPI, or our Asian American Pacific Islander uh, group, Hispanic, and also gender. Uh, those results have been uh, tabulated. There, uh, once again, we have had thousands of responses, uh, and we expect that the results will be coming uh, very shortly. The other thing that I think uh, is worthy of a few minutes of discussion uh, are these things that we call BOG, or Barrier Analysis Working Groups. We've had several uh, in the past, but they've actually been evolving over time. And really uh, quickly, what I'd like to do is kind of articulate the BOGs that uh, have been established uh, inside our Air Force. There's BEST, which is the Black Employment uh, Strategy Team, DAT, which is, which is the Disability Action Team, HEAT, which is the Hispanic Empowerment Action Team, INET, which is Indigenous Nations Equality Team, PACT, which is the Pacific Islander Asian American Community Team, WIT, uh, Women's Initiatives Team, uh, and lastly, and really we're doing this in honor of uh, Pride Month here in June, LIT, uh, which is the LGBTQ plus initiative team. So today, that's going to be the topic of this Real Talk, and, uh, and Brenda, uh, really, I think this is probably really an excellent place for us to start. Can you talk to us about uh, the, the BOG, or the Barrier Analysis Working Group, LIT, please? Yes, sir. Thanks. Um, and uh, just a shout out to my friends in the WIT, uh, I'm doing this for you, so thank you. Uh, so uh, by way of letting folks know what these teams do, is that they identify for senior DAP leadership, <clears throat> what are some of the barriers to hiring and retaining and having the best talent that we can, but also making sure that we understand the places where we might be creating uncomfortable environments or having language that doesn't work for all of the airmen that represent our Air Force. And in the case of LIT, for the lesbian, uh, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer plus um, uh, communities, and our airmen, that's what LIT hope wants to do. Um, and we have several lines of effort that we work on. I'll go into those a little bit. But uh, it's also, it's kind of fun. The acronym, the team gets to come up with an acronym, and it needs to be meaningful, and it needs to represent. But it also, uh, in some ways, can be how you want to show the world what you think of your team. And for us in LIT, we want to shine light and we want to keep the path lit for not only those who have come before us and have struggled mightily, uh, but also where we're headed into the future and, and, and shine the light on, on that. So lit, as you were saying, is, is fairly new. And uh, my good friend and a general officer I respect, uh, Major General Leah uh, Lauterbach, Lauterbach, she has done tremendous work mm -hmm. um, with the lit team and brought together, uh, we have several, a couple hundred airmen, I think now, and spouses and allies in the team, and it continues to grow. So we appreciate uh, the leadership of the Air Force enabling us to have this group. So 
some folks would might want to know, you know, what are some of the issues that are well, specific? Well, before you get that, I, I, I want to hit on one piece because I don't want the moment to go by, but you yeah. and I had an excellent uh, back and forth re with respect to the acronym LGBTQ+. Mm -hmm. And, you know, of course, my uh, really uninformed uh, perspective was, and in fact, I think I said, hey, Brenda, there's enough letters there now that, you know, we, we should probably need to uh, spell out something so it's a little bit easier to remember. But your response was actually very insightful. Would you mind sharing that with us? Thanks. Uh, yes, sir. I would love to share this with you. Uh, and a lot, of, I get that question a lot. What are all, what are all the letters and why so many? Um, I can boil it down uh, to one thing, really. It's the straight and non-straight or heterosexual and non-heterosexual communities and how not just airmen, but how society and people within society define sex and gender. And what, we've, what we are seeing as our society evolves and people are able to talk more about themselves and their families and how they live their lives and um, create family and community is that there's a whole spectrum of how people define themselves and others in terms of sex and gender. So the, the letters actually are uh, a celebration in a way of all of the diverse communities within the non-straight communities. And so lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and uh, queer, and plus is uh, there's intersex, there's asexual, there's pansexual. I mean, there are just any number of ways that folks define themselves uh, and, and live their lives to the fullest. I like the plus because it says that it's not limiting. There, there can be more as we all decide how we want to define ourselves. Um, the interesting letter is also the Q, yeah. right? Queer. Yeah. And in the past, as we all know, queer was a derogatory term. Mm. And the LGBTQ community over the past few years has decided to take that term back and own it and turn it into something that's celebrated and something that's used um, as a term to open up an entire um, a culture uh, behind that and thoughts and there's academic work behind it and research. I mean, it's really kind of a rich uh, environment and term behind that. And so that's why, and, and with Lit, we decided to definitely put the Q in there and the plus um, so that we can capture mm -hmm. as many airmen as we can today, but also leave it open to airmen of the future. Um, so I'm really yeah. excited yeah, about Really that. insightful, and I, I, I appreciate that you shared that the other day and, and sharing it this time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, okay, so you do have quite a bit of uh, uh, an agenda or uh, initiatives uh, within the LIT mm -hmm. uh, portfolio. Could you uh, describe some of those for us? Mm -hmm. And as a uh, uh, barrier analysis working group team, you're required to have initiatives, objectives, a vision, and you have to uh, report on that. And we hold meetings and, and we're accountable to how are we going to pursue these. So, so the big ones that we're looking at right now are uh, medical issues, issues around uh, transgender airmen, education, uh, particularly language and how we interact as senior leaders or uh, how we do things like marketing um, and uh, data, because if you're going to if you're going to determine that you have a barrier, whether you have a barrier or not, it's good to have data behind it, mm. because we all have anecdotes or stories or something that we're familiar with where we can say, oh yeah, that happened at this time or in this unit, and that in helps inform us where to look. But if you want to really identify barriers and work through them by changing policy. Um, changing law, and you know, in the case of your LGBTQ plus community, there's been a few changes in law, um, or where resources could be better be put. You need to be able to put the data behind it. So we do that. And then another issue that we're looking at is um, working a little bit right now with the Office of General Counsel around um, senior leader security. And I'll talk about that a little bit in a second. Okay. Um, but if I can, kind of, I'll just go backwards a little bit and, and talk about some of the initiatives or examples of, okay, why did LIT choose these as, yeah. as some of their um, uh, things that they're working on? <clears throat> the medical one, the, that also ties in with the transgender airmen and what our transgender airmen are, are going through in terms of care to medical um, resources. Um, and in some cases, 
transgender airmen can still be turned down by medical providers. So imagine just trying to get the care that you would normally get um, and being told, no, we won't see you. So we're looking at that as one of the transgender medical initiatives. The other thing that's a big deal is uh, access to reproductive support. So if you want to have a family and you're going to use um, reproductive support, because if you're in a same-sex marriage, then you do in vitro fertilization or you do surrogacy or something along those lines. And um, it's, it's interesting because say you have a same-sex female couple and they want to have children. Well, lots of couples do um, you know, in vitro fertilization or, or uh, methods that can get, um, get you on your road to having a, a family. And in the case of a same-sex female couple, if they were to access care to go into the mil military system and say, okay, we want to have a baby. Okay, well, which one of you is going to carry the baby? Okay, so this, this gal is going to be the one who will have the pregnancy and carry the baby. Fine. The military system knows how to recognize her and put her through mm -hmm. the care that she needs. But the other partner, the other female, uh, the military um, – and we're, we're working on this, didn't have language for that or a way to identify what mm -hmm. that other spouse is. And um, so there have been examples in the past where the military has said, well, we don't have a way to categorize you, so we're going to just consider you the sterile male. And so uh, it's like, and she's all, well, um, okay. I mean, how does that work, right? And it gets... It gets even more compl complex. When you go through these processes as the female sterile male, you still get asked questions on a lot of forms about, um, you know, did you have these tests and how did they come back? And it's like, no, I didn't, you know, didn't have the test because there's no reason to have a test. Right. So it just gets really kind of convoluted. Um, the other thing that's interesting uh, on the medical side too is when you ask a same-sex couple and you go in for your PHA or something and they ask you, um, what are your forms of birth control? And there, there isn't one on the form so, uh, that says uh, same-sex marriage. So there's a lot of um, heteronormative language that's used or forms or just updating for options yeah. on the medical side uh, uh, as one example. Um, in the education side, this is talking about giving resources and language to our airmen, especially to our leaders, about how to talk about it. What, is, what does the acronym mean? And mm -hmm. how do the individual parts of that acronym, where do they come together? Where do they diverge? And how can leaders have, be equipped with a language that helps them talk to their airmen? And um, some examples of that are, for instance, when the uh, airmen and family readiness hold, holds a class, they may say, you know, daddy and daughter class. And if you're in a same-sex female couple, well, there, there is no you in that phrase, or, you know, mommy and preschoolers. And it's okay. It's not to say to get rid of that language. Mm -hmm. It's to look at ways to have inclusive language that doesn't make folks who don't fit that particular um, <clears throat> category feel okay. I remember my spouse, uh, Anne, and I, we were a wing command couple at, at uh, Kirtland, and there was a marriage retreat that's great. Let, you know, let's go do a marriage retreat. Well, we picked up the pamphlet and we looked at it. It was straight couples, but we also noticed it was straight white couples. There, there were no biracial, multiracial couples. There were, you know, no same sex couples. And it's not that they were trying to, um, sometimes, and sometimes these are called kind of microaggressions in a way, or, um, where you're trying to do something meaningful, but the language or the way you present it just falls flat. Yeah. And so we're trying to identify those yeah. and, and bring those forward. So um, you, you have an agenda. I mean, it, it's a healthy initiative. It is. A batch of initiatives. It is. For sure. It's to make sure that our airmen are, are doing well. So um, the last thing I want to talk about real quick on this is uh, also talking with the Office of General Counsel on senior leader security. Because the LGBTQ plus community, as everybody's aware of, uh, off, is often the target of harassment, mm. um, hate, and threats. And our senior leaders are getting that in the military, not just general officers, but wing commanders uh, and other commanders who are being allies of the LGBTQ plus community or are part of it and are 
speaking out and leading airmen. Uh, in fact, this week I was at Keesler Air Force Base for a Pride event, and the, uh, the event there was fantastic, and the wing commander, uh, Colonel Blackwell, did a terrific job, and she has been doing these initiatives and talks as well for the past year and a half. And for the first time in a year and a half, holding these events, she had to have armed security forces come in and clear the areas and then also be present for the, the panel and the talks um, because of the threats that she had heard of and, and they had received because of this particular um, subject. Mm -hmm. So we're working to try to identify ways that we can look at who is, who is threatening, mm -hmm. what's going on with that, and then mitigate it and address it. So really interesting kind of spectrum. Yeah, of and, and tons. Actually, you know, it kind of uh, precluded the, the other question I was going to ask along that lines was uh, uh, do the BOGs kind of compare notes and how different are the agendas? But you just laid out that uh, there may be some similar ground there, but there is tons of unplowed ground, mm -hmm. period, mm -hmm. uh, certainly within LIT that, mm -hmm. you, that you just uh, laid out. Sure, and I so. think the language one is definitely one that can go across the teams mm -hmm. uh, because that's important, uh, and, and the whole education piece uh, is definitely one. So, yes, sir. Yeah. So, Brenda, if we, if we could shift gears uh, yes. just a little bit. Uh, you, you and I have known each other literally decades, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, suffice to say our uh, experiences in the military uh, probably, uh, even though we're both special operators uh, by uh, trade, uh, probably couldn't be more disparate. Uh, I was wondering if you would share uh, with us kind of your journey, if you would. Yes, sir, I will. Um, and most of my journey was under Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And it's been uh, an interesting journey because I came in at the time when women in combat, uh, that was being overturned and women were allowed to come in combat. Um, and also Don't, Don't Ask, Don't Tell was in, in place or put in place and then was in place for years. And so um, I, when I first, uh, you know, came into the Air Force, um, kind of being here as a special operator and talking about my spouse, my wife, Ann Harrington, would have been impossible. Uh, so being here is, um, it's really special. So thank you for this opportunity to talk about this. Um, in my early years under Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and I know I speak for a lot of my friends when I talk about this, um, by the way, we're celebrating the 10th anniversary of the repeal in 2011. Uh, we lived really compartmented lives because Don't Ask, Don't Tell was an interesting policy in that it allowed you to be in, but you just couldn't say anything. And people think, well, you just couldn't say you were gay oh, well, or lesbian or bi. I, I get that, but that comes with a whole lot of... Um, difficulties and challenges uh, that people don't even realize. Um, and don't, you know, so don't ask, don't tell. So our friends couldn't ask and we couldn't tell. The pro, well, there's multiple problems with it, but it just required you to live this super compartmented life where I and my friends had to come to work every day and do the mission and support the mission that we love without ever saying anything about our family, our partner, or our significant others. And I tell my friends who did not live under Don't Ask, Don't Tell, um, try going through 20 hours without mentioning anything that indicates that you have a family uh, or that you uh, are married or any of that. Just try for 20 hours or try it for 20 days. So we did it for 20, almost 20 years. Hmm. We had to live in a way that we were allowed to show up every day and be a part of the Air Force family, but not really have a family. And those compartments were really difficult. And things as simple as deployments, which as you know, we deployed a lot. And when you deploy, usually your family drives you up to the squadron, drops you off, you grab your A bags and everything, and you go into the squadron and the family, families come in and you kind of spend those last moments together before you jump on the rotator and go down range. Um, well, I could never do that. And so my partner would drive me, you know, or it's always zero dark or, or, or zero dark uh, 30 in the morning. So drive up to the squadron and I would just get out of the car and grab my bags, you know, no hugs, no nothing, just, okay, see ya, kind of waving as if I had taken an Uber, uh, which didn't exist at the time, but um, it was like that. And then I'd go into the squadron and I'd 
be around everybody else and try to, you know, kind of act like I'm cool, you know, everything's good to go. Uh, and then you get on the rotator and you go. And then when you're downrange, everybody else, if something were to have happened to you, they would have called Miss Donna. And if, um, you know, the worst happened to you, then somebody would have shown up, a team in, in service dress, and they would have provided all the support. Well, that wasn't the case for us uh, in our community. Um, we just had to hope that nothing happened. Um, and if something did, that somehow our friends who knew in the squadron would be able to go um, handle things the best they could. Uh, but that was really scary living like that. And then on the return side of yeah. deployments, the rotator pulls up. And as you know, we had Operation Homecoming every month. The rotator would come in and he had the families and the dogs and the kids and everybody in balloons and everybody gets off the airplane and, and greets their loved ones. And uh, I just got off the airplane, right? Walked through and I mean, I was happy to see people, but uh, I had to go outside and bring my bags and kind of load them in a car and again, pretend like I just had somebody I knew pick me up when in fact it was, you know, my significant other. So, uh, but as a squadron commander, I really loved that the Air Force did all that. And so I supported it and I went to them and I wanted to support our families like that. So I, I kind of lived this, this dual life. Um, the other thing that was interesting about living other, under Don't Ask, Don't Tell is it created this artificial vulnerability in terms of security clearances. Mm. Because if we have this artificial requirement or, or, or um, uh, restriction on being uh, gay in the military, because we decide it, that, then there was always the issue of, well, you could be blackmailed if, if anybody finds out you're gay. Well, it's like, why are we imposing that on ourselves? Um, and so we, once Don't Ask, Don't Tell was lifted, it was like, okay, yay, that was easy. We got rid of that security vulnerability literally for no reason. Uh, that was in place. Uh, the other thing, too, is I love the Air Force. I love AFSAC. I love the mission. But I could not be fully present. I wanted to. I gave everything I could. But it was, you know, half of myself because I always had half of myself tied behind my back because it was that compartment of who my family was and yeah. what was important to me outside of that. And so there was just, and I know our other airmen were very restricted by that as well, our other um, LGBTQ plus airmen. So uh, let's, if you don't mind, I, I'll, I want to talk a little bit about the Air Force core values. Okay. And Air Force core values were something that I thought about a lot. And I was in the Air Force when, when they were um, created. And, you know, you look at service before self, excellence, and all we do, uh, and integrity. In service before self, that is something that I will tell you that uh, your LGBTQ members who were serving under Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and today, but really under Don't Ask, Don't Tell, they were all about service before self. Um, I think um, the Secretary of Defense a couple weeks ago said it really well in his DOD pride speech. Uh, he said, they fought for our country even when our country wouldn't fight for them. And we put everything we love and know aside uh, to continue fighting uh, to, for our country. So service before self is something I, I really relate to. Um, excellence in all we do. And this is kind of a one that my friends and I in the LGBTQ plus community kind of joke about because we wanted, we wanted to be in so bad that we gave everything we had to it. And we would joke that you could almost tell who was uh, in the LGBTQ plus community because they'd have all these awards. Um, when you talk about excellence in all you do, uh, including one of my friends who's a retired chief. And for the 30 years that she was in, she had a quarterly or yearly award every year that she served. And part of that was wanting to be excellent and wanting to serve, but part of it was also wanting to be above reproach so that if somebody th thought, well, I don't really like you, so I'm going to report you uh, to OSI, that you could find yourself in a, in a situation uh, that could ru ruin your career. And so you wanted to be that airman that your commanders and your leadership said, you know what, she's so awesome, he's so awesome, like, we're just going to keep going from yeah. here. And, uh, and so that was, you know, that was something that was always <laughs> present for us. And then, you know, integrity, I, I always had to live under don't ask, don't tell with the, nobody could ask me, but people in the no course of a normal conversation talk about family. We're talking about in the Air Force all the time, which is great. You know, are you married? Do you have kids? And so sometimes people would just say, oh, you're, oh, you're not married yet. Um, are you going to be? Or something very yeah. innocent like that. Yeah. 
And I would say to them, if I meet the man who is my match, I will marry him. And I, knowing that was an infinitesimally small chance probably, <laughs> uh, but I, you know, I suppose it would have been true too. So that's, that's kind of how I, I handled that. But living under Don't Ask, Don't Tell was very confusing. The other thing it was confusing for was not just the lesbian, gay, bi members. It was also everybody like you and our other airmen who knew us. So we had to be really careful because we never wanted to put our friends and our coworkers in yeah. a bind. Yeah. So those of us who knew about us also had to kind of keep it hidden. So they had to, and if um, you, if we wanted to share ourselves authentically with our coworkers, now we're putting them in a position mm -hmm. of having to hold, hold that in case something were to come up in an investigation or whatever. It really just put everybody in this strange bind. Yeah. So when it was repealed, that was, that was a fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Before, uh, before we uh, shift yes, to sir. that, I, I just want to comment on the core values because I, I love the way you laid that out. Uh, and every, all three of those uh, examples, the excellence one, I, I would comment on uh, just because I was recently made aware, by the way, you know, you're hey, kind of award winners, you know, you know, is a kind of a signal or a sign or whatever. Uh, I was recently made aware of an airman uh, that was, uh, as a serving, you know, blue suit airman, uh, she, uh, she was a firefighter and was airman uh, of the Outstanding Airman of the Year uh, selectee. And uh, because of the challenges that she's, uh, you know, confronted along her uh, journey, I got out of the uh, active duty blue suit wearing uh, Air Force, was a GS, and she's now a, uh, she's now a two-time uh, Outstanding Airman of the Year Award recipient, now as a GS. And it kind of awesome. backs up the, the point you're yes, making sir. there. So yes, sir. Yes, sir. level of excellence. Okay, so tell us about uh, the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell in yes, September sir. 20th, 2011, <laughs> 2011. Right? yes. Um, the... The most terrifying and unremarkable day of my career, uh, and, I, and I say that, you know, knowing I've done a lot of combat and been in a lot of challenging situations, but the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, uh, Congress worked on that for quite a while, and they did the vote at the end of 2010, but they said there's going to be this cooling off period for nine months, which is why it didn't actually go into the repeal into effect in September of 2011. And I remember watching the vote on TV. I was actually um, at, in California at Senior uh, Developmental Education at, at Stanford. Yep. And I watched the vote, and I was so excited when it passed. And, and then afterward, it was like, well, that, that's great, but what are we holding on to for the next nine or ten months for this cooling off period? And evidently, <clears throat> it was to have a lot of training. And so a lot of the airmen who, are, who were in back then know, and they had to go through this repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell training and what it was going to be like. And um, I had to go through it. Uh, I think I probably did it by CBT. Um, and, uh, and I thought, wait, I I've been in the Air Force this whole time. And now, you know, everybody has to take training because they're going to just find out that I am who I am. Uh, and the other thing, too, was um, there was no training specifically for me or for people like me who were going to have the option now to serve freely and be who we were. So if you wanted to come out or if you wanted to tell people or if you're just going through this transition of living this extraordinarily compartmented life, you're allowed to open those compartments now. How do you do that? There was no training for us. There was nothing. It was just, you know, good luck. Have fun with that. And I, I thought, this is really strange. It seemed backwards. But the day that came along, September 20th, 2011, I was working on the joint stuff in the Pentagon. And for everybody who's worked in the Pentagon, you know, the Metro pulls up and 23,000 or whatever <laughs> people pour off the Metro and the parking into the Pentagon. It fills up. Everybody's in their office or their cubes. And then at the end of the day, it empties out. And it's just day after day after day. And so the day before I was going to go in on September 20th, and it was repealed, um, I was at home with Anne, and I was nervous as a cat in a hot tin roof. Like, what was it going to be like tomorrow? I don't know. I was like, I don't get this nervous before going on a combat mission, right? <laughs> mission plan. You're like, okay, we got this, and off you go. I did not have this. I, I was... Um, wow, what do I do? And Anne said, just go to work. 
just put on your uniform and go to work. And uh, okay, so that that was the direct, that was the uh, commander's intent I was given. <laughs> right. um, go to work. The big boss. The big boss. So what did I do? I got on the metro, um, rode the metro, got off the metro, got onto the, the escalator, went into the office or went into the hallways, and everybody else did too. It was totally boring, totally normal. I just walked in, and I was like, you know what? Um, my existence today and my freedom to be who I fully am did not melt down the military. The Department of Defense is still operating just like every other day, um, and it's so normal, and that felt so good because I, have ne up until that day, had never been able to just feel normal in the military. And that was this huge sense of relief. And my friends that I talked to felt the same way. Like, God, it's just great. Um, and that day went on, like, and all the days after it. And so, I mean, we've done a lot since then um, to, to become more vocal and more out and um, represent. But at the time, I didn't, I didn't tell anybody. I just, just showed up to work. And sure. that, that was pretty cool. So, and the military did not come apart. <laughs> and the Pentagon did not sink into the ground. So we made it. Yes, sir. Awesome. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe one more acronym uh, that we should uh, go through, DOMA. DOMA. Can you explain that uh, to our, us yeah. and our audience? Yes, sir. So DOMA was passed in the 1990s, Defensive Marriage Act, and it uh, stated that marriage would be recognized only between one man and one woman. And, um, and that was... The thing about DOMA is that it did not allow military members um, in LGBTQ relationships to be married. Uh, so you could, though, individual states started allowing same-sex marriage in their states. And the, uh, the repeal, or the, in 2013, the Supreme Court took a case called Windsor versus U.S., and this was actually a case about taxes, uh, but it ended up implementing uh, the um, policies that we have today in the federal government with regard to recognizing marriage. And so uh, Edie Win Windsor and her partner were a uh, same-sex female couple, and they were married in Canada, but their marriage was recognized in New York. And her partner, uh, Thea, died and they had been together for over 40 years, and they were legally married. Mm. But the, um, the, the, their marriage was not recognized for, from the federal government and the IRS, and they came after uh, Edie Windsor for between three and $400,000 in taxes. So a straight married couple wouldn't have had to pay those taxes, uh, but... Edie was told she had to. And so that, she took that to court and that went up to the Supreme Court and they ruled that that um, violated, um, uh, the, that DOMA uh, violated uh, the Fifth Amendment, I believe, the Constitution. And so by overturning the Defense of Marriage Act, they recognized that the federal government would recognize same-sex marriages. And this is important because what that meant for military members mm -hmm. is now our marriages, if we got married in D.C. or married in a state that allowed it, now the military would recognize it and you could um, be married. You could have full access to the family care and, and everything that the military provided. But what it didn't do was legalize marriage across all 50 states. So... If you are a same-sex couple, like Anne and I, and you're PCS and you're in D.C., we got married in October of 2013, and you're in Washington, D.C., you're good to go. But as soon as you PCS um, and you drive on the interstate, depending on what state you're in, if you got in a car accident or something happened, that state may or may not recognize you as the uh, spouse. And so they could say, yeah, you're, I'm sorry, you're... you're partner is in the hospital, but you can't go see her. Uh, but somebody else who was a family member could, and they could also say that I couldn't go in to see her uh, if that were to happen. So it was a really complex environment to be in at the time. 
And that created a lot of interesting conundrums for us. And so then 2015, actually it was uh, June 26, 2013 was the repeal of DOMA and then June 26, 2015. So exactly, so 13 to 15, two years later was the, uh, the Supreme Court ruled, ruled on what's called Ogerfell versus Hodges. And okay, what was that? And that was the Supreme Court determined that the, there was a fundamental right under the 14th Amendment in this case uh, for same-sex couples to marry, and that's guaranteed under the 14th Amendment of the Constitution, and our me marriages would be recognized in all 50 states. Okay, so the first one overturned DOMA, which let federal government recognize us, and then the second one was marriage equality in all 50 states. And now we could re really, truly live um, as a married couple wherever we were uh, stationed in the United States. So those are sort of the big... Yeah, the big well, Brenda, forces. thanks. Uh, sure. that, uh, I know that that uh, does a lot uh, to digest hist historical-wise, mm -hmm. but the fact, the point is, you've been an airman, a serving <laughs> airman, through all of this uh, historical time frame. Yes, sir. Uh, and when we, you know, we kind of stated up front the initiatives that LIT has is underway, which is pretty healthy. Mm -hmm. uh, just from the small list of that mm -hmm. you articulated, there's there's been a lot. So I guess really the point is there's been a lot of ground covered mm -hmm. and a lot of positive ground, uh, but but this is maybe only the end. It's not the end. It maybe is the end of the beginning. Uh, yes, sir. You that's, could say. You could. That's a good um, way of putting it. Mm -hmm. Marilyn, or or do we have uh, some folks that are looking to chime in by chance? We have a few shout outs. This is the time for us to remind everybody to get their questions in. We only have a few questions so far, but okay. we have some that we can add in too. Um, so we have uh, Jeanette Santos who says, thank you for visiting Keesler and sharing your knowledge and wisdom with our airmen. Thank you, Jeanette. She was part of the committee and led the committee that put together that, that pride event. Fantastic. So thank you, Captain Santos. Someone you know, Ann Harrington. <laughs> Shout out to the great Sink work House. Lit is doing and Major General Latterback's vision and leadership in getting that BOG team started. Uh, Kathy Miller says, thank you for all your brave service and sacrifice for the freedom we continue to enjoy. God bless you all. I, I'd like to ask a question that, that we had just in case we needed to chime in with other questions, and, and that would be, ma'am, so... Is the focus on LGBTQ plus making the military weaker? What would you say to someone if you were asked that? I would say absolutely not. In fact, the opposite is true. It's making it stronger. And here's why. When I talked about living the compartments and kind of not being able to be your full self, even though you want to and you want to bring everything you have to the mission, the, the worry, the concerns, the distractions around being found out, hmm. um, our families not being supported or recognized at all, that kept us from being 100% in our mission. So even though you know, we win awards, we do good things, and we, and we uh, thrive, it was, it's not full. And so once Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed, DOMA was overturned, and we were allowed to, to be open, full members of the Air Force community, we became stronger. Because then we started to be able to go do the mission knowing if something happened, our families were taken care of. They had um, the, all the resources, medical, family resource center, anything like that. Um, and it, made, it makes me stronger and able to bring my full power of what I want to do and can do for the military to work every day. And I know that our LGBTQ plus airmen feel that way as well. Because if something is distracting you and something is holding you back that hard, um, I think under Don't Ask, Don't Tell, we were actually a weaker military then. And now we're stronger because you got us 100%. Um, and we, the, we are stronger not just in the LGBTQ plus community, but we're stronger because of diversity across the board. And you said it earlier in our discussion, sir, with the different initiatives, uh, the teams under the BOG, <clears throat> there are cross-cutting initiatives. Yeah. And now we have really focused teams looking at this at all levels and bringing that up. And as we fix policies and we work together, um, it's, it makes us stronger and better. And it also, we're an all-volunteer force. 
So if we need to recruit, train, and retain the best quality, being a place that uh, is open and supportive, people are going to look at the Air Force and say, or the, uh, the military, but look at the Air Force and say, I want to go do that um, because they take care of me and they take care of our families. That makes us stronger because we can retain, we can recruit and retain the best talent. I fully feel that we are stronger because of it. I like the point, uh, I've heard you state earlier, you know, hey, okay, there's been some repeals of these acts and uh, so forth, but that didn't just say, hey, gay and lesbian, transgender, so that you're free to join the military. They've always been in the military. Absolutely, uh, sir. Yes. Right? I mean, I don't, don't yes. let me uh, steal your words on that, but, uh, you know, I think no. from that standpoint, it's... Uh, 100%. Yeah. Always been. We've always been in the military, and... That is, so it's not that suddenly the doors were open and all the LGBTQ plus people rushed in and diluted the military. We just, like I said, we just showed up to work again on <laughs> September 20th, 2011 and kept doing our thing. Uh, but we could do it even better and just feel better. And so it, we have been among the, the services for years. Mm -hmm. And um, the Secretary of Defense mentioned that as well in his remarks. And he talked about some of the folks in the past that have done really meritorious uh, work in combat and not. Um, so, right, yeah. it, it, that's a great point, sir. The, uh, I've got another question. If you, um, we, uh, we've been spending this uh, time here talking, you know, I kind of, you know principally on lesbian, gay, um, but there's been uh, a number of uh, policies and policy reversals and reenactments of policies with respect to transgender. Would you mind uh, sharing some of that perspective with us? Mm -hmm. So I was a wing commander when uh, our transgender airmen were allowed to um, serve, and that was uh, brought on board, that policy. That was terrific. And we had, I had transgender airmen who were really nervous about coming forward and talking to their commanders, frontline supervisors, um, or to me about that because they were very concerned about would the policy be reversed. And I'll tell you what, there are lesbian, gay, bisexual service members who served on way before Don't Ask, Don't Tell, back when there were witch hunts. And you could get arrested and put in confinement for being gay. And this happened. And um, they served under such... A, a hostile environment that to this day, even at long retired, they still won't come out because they were concerned after Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed that at some point it might get switched. And now everybody's out and now, well, it's kind of hard to say I'll marry the man, you know, when I, uh, uh, if I meet the man who's my match, I'll marry him because uh, I'm married to Ann Harrington. So that's a vulnerability, right? And so for the LGB community, that worked out okay. But for the transgender community, that policy actually was reversed. And um, transgender airmen or transgender people who wanted to come into the Air Force were told, nope, you, you're not allowed uh, and turned away. And so that trust that we rely on as airmen, as special operators, as the, when we go into those tough situations, we rely on our trust for each other. And we broke that trust with our airmen. And we broke that trust with the people who prepared and took the test and did everything it did, did, took to become qualified to come in. And that was heartbreaking for me uh, because, uh, as I said, I, I had uh, transgender airmen in my wing. And I know of some today who had to live that that terrifying experience. So I think things have turned around now and have stabilized, but that is something that we need to be really cognizant of, and let's not make that mistake again. Yes, sir. In that same vein where you were talking about serving all along, um, Rob Nyland asked, how do you think that the Air Force can improve the way that we recruit LGBTQ plus airmen? Mm-hmm. Some simple things are just, again, the language and the way that we uh, represent what the Air Force looks like. When you talk about, you know, go to central casting and get me the, the, the person to put on the poster. 
um, let's, let's put the person on the recruiting poster or the people that um, let our LGBTQ plus communities know that they're, they're represented and they're welcome. Um, events like this, and General Webb, you've been doing a terrific job of just bringing this out, not just our group, but uh, all of the real talks that you've done that say, hey, your leadership, if you come into the Air Force, your leadership cares about you. And not because um, you have to, but because you genu genuinely want to. And that starts at the top. And so for people looking, you know, hey, I want to join the military. What, where, do, where should I want, where should I go? Um, the Air Force is a place that is open and welcoming. So if we can have our recruiters messaging that and we can have our material that's online or any of that that's just represent it, representative and uses inclusive language. Mm -hmm. Heather Hodge says, thank you for this and happy pride. Happy I'm, Pride. <laughs> I'm curious, are there any programs being discussed for parents of transgender kids? I've struggled with the thought of getting an assignment to some place that would cause challenges for my child. For example, many states this year are proposing to ban affirmative care for trans kids or ban them from sports. That is an excellent question. And that's one I don't know uh, of what policies and programs we may be working on along those lines, but I've taken a note and I will bring that up at the lit uh, to make sure that we're looking at that. Thanks for that question. Mm -hmm. That's it for the questions for now. Okay. Um, well, uh, Brenda, you know, uh, I think I would just uh, summarize this in saying uh, uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, I can only, uh, like I said, we've known each other for uh, at least two decades, uh, and uh, and have a very similar uh, background from a special operations background, and and the past couldn't be more different. And uh, uh, this, you know, what really resonates with me is the is your uh, really the discussion on core values uh, and service, and uh, um, you know, there's just like a, a, a number of these initiative groups. There are a lot of extra rocks in this rucksack. Uh, that's being carried uh, that uh, we may uh, not even be aware of mm -hmm. uh, from those of us that aren't uh, LGBTQ plus mm -hmm. or what have you. Um, so, uh, so really, you, you've hit on this a, a few times, and it's, and it's my kind of concluding remarks uh, every time, and that is, uh, you know, the events that happened last summer, uh, first with the Protect Our Defenders report and then with the death of George Floyd, uh, fundamentally changed uh, America. It fundamentally, for sure, changed the Air Force. Mm -hmm. uh, and the charge could not have been more clear uh, from our past uh, Secretary of the Air Force and Chief uh, and our current uh, Chief and Acting Secretary, and that is uh, to engage. Because I remain absolutely convinced uh, that history is being made. And we as leaders, uh, and frankly all service members in our Air Force, will be judged. Uh, on this, and if that, and if all that is true, and if all that is uh, as we believe, uh, diversity is a war fighting imperative. It is absolutely a war fighting imperative, and this is about readiness. This is about mission accomplishment. Uh, then wh why don't we make good history? Exactly. So, uh, uh, folks, history. thanks uh, very much for uh, tuning in uh, to this edition of uh, Real Talk, Brenda. I really appreciate uh, you being our, our honored guest uh, for this, and thank you, uh, sir. and thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks.